So what you started to see was companies adopting voluntary environmental commitments as a way to offset or work around the threat of environmental regulation. So for instance, companies saying, we don't need you to regulate us. We've developed our own benchmarking and auditing process for our environmental footprint. We have our own indices. Um, we're developing partnerships with environmental organizations or advocates, sometimes called public-private partnerships, PPPs, ways for companies to really do a, do a lot of PR, you know, say, hey, we're working with the World Wildlife Fund. We're working with the Environmental Defense Fund. We're, we're uh, sitting together at the table and talking about strategies that work for all of us. These are a variety of different ways of inserting themselves into environmental conversations. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label, distinguishing organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Melissa Aronchek, a professor of environmental communication at Rutgers University, and she's the author of A Strategic Nature, Public Relations and the Politics of American Environmentalism. Melissa's work offers important context to the conversation we've been having around chemical no-till agriculture, being called regenerative by enormous industrial players, and we're glad to include her in our 2023 online symposium. If you haven't seen it yet, tickets are still available to watch the recordings from that event, where we discuss the support of the USDA for chemical no-till agriculture under the banner of regenerative and climate smart agriculture. We interviewed 50 thought leaders on this topic, and you can find tickets to the recordings at realorganicsymposium.org. So welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I'm very pleased today to be talking with Melissa Aronchek, whom I've been um, waiting quite a while to talk to. She's been busy, and here we are. Melissa is an associate professor of media studies at Rutgers in the uh, School of Communication and Information, and she is the co-author of the recently uh, released book, A Strategic Nature, Public Relations and the Politics of Environmentalism with Maria Espinoza. That's, that's a long introduction for me. I normally just blast in, but you know, I, I suspect uh, Melissa, that um, a lot of the people listening to this won't be familiar with your work, and they should be. So, well, thank um, you. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, good. Well, so let let's talk about about your work. Um, I, I know where I want to dive in. I want to dive in with Rachel Carson. But do you want to talk a little bit about your study of public relations and what that might mean for for us citizens? Absolutely. So. Um, the way that I came to thinking about this book, A Strategic Nature, uh, started maybe eight years ago. Um, I had already written quite a bit about branding. I was very interested in thinking critically about how brands uh, gain such loyalty among their communities, you know, whether it's shoes or in the case of what I was writing about countries, I was really interested in how countries were hiring branding consultants to remake their image in a globalizing marketplace, uh, I was just struck by the kind of magic power that it seemed to exert over people. So when I came to thinking about public relations, I initially approached it from the same uh, direction. I was thinking about how public relations is so powerful and yet so unseen. Most of us can't name a PR firm. We don't know any people who do PR, you know, these aren't household names. And yet they really control how we see institutions, organizations, and individuals in the media uh, and, and in everyday life. So I was, again, I was fascinated by that. And um, I was encouraged by a colleague of mine uh, to think about how that magic or that power worked in the realm of environmental problems. I had been thinking some to some extent about environmental problems, and I had been writing about them uh, 
uh, for some years before. Um, I'm from Canada originally, and uh, I've been spending some time uh, thinking about, uh, among other projects, um, how Canadian national identity was so tied up with uh, oil and with the tar sands, especially in Alberta, as those were becoming so um, popular as a, as a domestic energy resource. But I was really concerned about how that was affecting Canadian sense of self. Uh, I spent some time in Alberta looking at that problem, writing about that. Um, with this project on public relations, um, Maria Espinoza, my, my co-author and I, decided to focus on something that we started seeing uh, as a very unusual or interesting parallel. And that was that we would look at a problem, uh, let's say, of air pollution. And we would look at all of the public relations, the lobbying, the marketing that went on around the problem of air pollution. And then we would ask ourselves, well, was there a problem like this prior to discussions about air pollution in, you know, in the 1970s or 60s? And sure enough, we found other discussions of public relations around air pollution in the 1960s. Then we thought, is it even earlier? And we, we kept going back decade by decade until we finally realized that really since the beginning of the 20th century, as environmental problems like air pollution were surfacing and communities were worrying about them, that publicity agents of various stripes were actually working very carefully with companies that were their clients to control how that problem was understood and how it was talked about and what kinds of decisions were made around it. So this book, A Strategic Nature, is really a kind of 100-year history of the relationship between environmental problems and the management of those problems through public relations. That's very interesting. Uh, you've sort of, it sounds like it started in the progressive era. I think the Sherman Antitrust Act passed in 1890, mm -hmm. which was a big deal. That was a big deal. Sure. And I don't think we could pass such a law today. Do you think? Well, that's a great question. Um, in that progressive era, one thing we did see in the early 20th century was a real drive for reform. Um, and I have been thinking very hard about that period of reform and how a lot of the elements of that period of reform came back in the 1960s when, as we know, I know we're going to talk about Rachel Carson, but there was a real uh, momentum, a uh, real spurring of action around reform. And I think right now, some of the conversations that we're having about big tech, for instance, about trying to break up some of those monopolies, I wonder if we're not entering a third period of reform that uh, is not so different from those antitrust movements that were happening right at the turn of the 20th century. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, um, I got to interview Michael Pollan a couple of times, and he taught me a lot about the Sherman Antitrust Act. And one of the things he taught me that I was completely unaware of is that it was not written to protect as a con consumer protection act. It was written to protect the republic. It was written to protect the citizen from undue concentration of power over government. And uh, the, the act is still in, in, it's still a law, but it's not enforced anymore. It's been transformed and, and, and that transformation happened during Reagan's administration. Robert Bork wrote uh, a little, a little, note about that, that it should be used to protect the consumer from high prices. And as long as it doesn't, we don't need to worry about it. It's a very different intention. Um, when we think about the consumer versus the citizen, you know, which identity we're going to have, uh, I, I've seen some really, <laughs> I've, I've been watching a lot of those conversations taking place. You know, which identity do we need to have to push for greater protections. In other words, how will we be most protected? Will it be as a consumer or will it be as a citizen? And, you know, in the United States, of course, the consumer identity is really front and center. Um, so much of our economy, you know, structured around markets, structured around delivering consumers what they need or what they want, creating desire for consumers. Um, yeah, I, I sometimes, 
uh, ask myself which kinds of protections are, are going to be the most effective. That's interesting that, that the U.S. would be the place most likely for us to identify as consumers and to see that as a, an important protection. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about marketing, um, obviously. I mean, it's very popular in branding and people are branding themselves now. <laughs> you know, what a funny way to think of yourself. Um, how are we to understand that progression? They're all storytelling from uh, what uh, uh, an activist or a teacher might do. You're trying to teach some kind of truth or honesty in, in your academic setting so that people can get something that isn't so, um, a story that isn't so designed to, to benefit a company. You're just trying to say just the facts, please. And, um, and on that other end of that stream, there's something that is really intended to mislead people. That is the intention. Is that, do you, do you see it that way? I'm trying to understand the difference between PR, lobbying, marketing. Oh, I, I understand. Um, yeah, my, well, let, you know what, maybe I, I, the easiest way for me to talk about this is to talk about what I jokingly describe as my shady past. So I worked in advertising um, back in the 1990s, which feels like a very long time ago. This was kind of pre-digital era. Uh, and that's, that's not where I first developed a fascination with advertising. I've actually been fascinated with ads, marketing, branding, all that stuff since I was a teenager. Um, and thought about it a lot. When I worked in advertising is when I really started to understand the distinction between those different promotional industries. Um, advertising is very visual. It's very much about the campaigns that you'll see now on TV, on YouTube, um, you know, everywhere else we now access our, our media. Public relations is, is uh, it's a different animal. Public relations is about creating relationships between a company or any kind of organization and a public or a, a lot of publics, depending on who we're trying to reach. But often that relationship is meant to seem as organic as possible, by which I mean it's, it's not meant to look like there are strings attached. It's not just about showing you an image and saying, you know, here we're cultivating desire in this product and we hope you buy it like an ad would. Public relations is most successful when the people doing the public relations are completely invisible. And yet there's a kind of, um, I don't know, I don't want to use the word control, but there's a kind of appeal to people's self-interest or their values uh, or their ideas about the world and a, an attempt to make the organization that's hired this PR firm look like it fits into those values or those those ideas about the world so that we feel connected to it. And it's that kind of connection that I that I just find so so fascinating. Lobbying is a kind of extension of public relations. It's traditionally been associated with governments. So we think here of instead of directly public relations, it would be called government relations. But it's the same kind of work. Again, it's about appealing to people uh, trying to get them to share our interests, trying to get them uh, to to share the point of view that we're trying to put forward. In the case of government relations, it's often then about uh, having some impact on a bill or any kind of piece of legislation or regulation that might be passed. In in my experience, uh, I have experienced in the in the efforts to reform the National Organic Program that those campaigns involve a lot of. Um, disinformation or misinformation that that they're often actually intended to confuse and mm. and they do they're quite successful at confusing people is that how, what do you think about that that's you know we're, we're getting into a thorny a thorny landscape right now and and this is a topic i think a lot about misinformation and disinformation are um you know they're hot button words they're very big right now because we're in an era where i think we lack trust in a lot of the people who are speaking to us, um, or at least we're being trained to be more suspicious of the information that's out there for a wide range of reasons, whether that's corporate information or so-called disinformation, governments, media, that, you know, this is really a, um, 
a conversation that's happening in our media, even as we're worrying about the effects of so-called disinformation and misinformation. Public relations and lobbying, um, because they're influence-based, because they're always trying to influence um, their audiences or their publics, it it's rarely about presenting both sides of an issue. It's often about presenting a particular angle or a particular frame or point of reference, because of course we want to influence our audience or public to think the way we think. So it's not a very far jump from there to disinformation or misinformation. So I want to, you know, I want to acknowledge that that's a very real concern or a very real issue that arises in these promotional industries. But I do want to be careful because, you know, disinformation is one of those words where, you know, it's never something you're doing, it's only something other people are doing, right? So you are always just providing the facts or just providing the information for people to make up their own minds, while they, you know, those bad guys, whoever they are, wherever they are, they're the ones doing the propaganda or the disinformation. So I find with a term like that, you know, sometimes you can kind of end a conversation when you use the word disinformation. And I, I want to think really carefully when I'm doing my research, especially into these influencers and the, you know, these people in these promotional industries, how do they think about what they're doing? What motivates them to do what they do? And what are the steps by which they actually do it? So in other words, maybe at the end of the day, I'll call it disinformation. But before I do that, I really want to understand what's involved and what's going through these people's minds. Why are they creating messages the way they create them? Or why are they relating to certain publics? That helps me get, I would say, a much more practical or down-to-earth understanding of how these industries actually work. Yeah. You know, I've encountered it in, say, major news stories in the New York Times and... Uh, the journalist knows that a certain group of people are not being honest. But when the story comes out, it's like I have to present both sides. And there's no indication that they know that this side is being dishonest. I will say that in the stories I was talking to you about earlier in the Washington Post, Peter Oriski did not do that. And he was quite willing to call out people that he felt were speaking dishonestly and being fraudulent. I, I had one journalist who, who wrote a story and, and she said, how'd you like it? I said, I hated it. You know, you, you <laughs> presented both sides as if they're even, but you know that they're lying. And she said, well, yeah. I said, the Washington Post doesn't do that. She said, well, I'm not an investigative journalist. They're an investigative journalist. And I don't want to be one. My parents were and they got death threats. And I thought, well, God, I think it's just called journalism, you know, to, to try and find the truth. But that's a question. Is that, I mean, you know, is it, is it appropriate to print both sides knowing one side is being dishonest? You know, I've heard uh, some great, I've heard you mentioned earlier Bill McKibben. I've heard Bill McKibben speak about this. I've I read a great book by Eric Pooley on this topic. Uh, they were both speaking specifically about uh, reporting on the climate, reporting on climate change. And they talked about how that both sides-ism really set back the conversation about the realities of global warming by 20 to 30 years, that for the longest time, if a journalist was writing about global warming, they always felt they had to find someone who believed in global warming and someone who didn't believe in global warming or had other ways of looking at the problem. Like, um, you know, what about the economic costs of global warming instead of the, the moral responsibility or the, the scientific, you know, um, human existence <laughs> reasons. And uh, so, People like McKibben and others were extremely critical of journalists um, doing that in their their news reporting. And I, I think um, there's, a, there's a group uh, out of Columbia University now, uh, I think it's called Covering Climate Now, and it's a group of journalists and others, media makers and institutions that have recognized that as an issue and are really working to, to overcome it, really changing the amount of space they devote in their newsroom to climate coverage, um, to being a lot more critical about the both sides approach, excuse me, the both sides approach, um, and, and to just really taking more seriously climate change as a reality, as a condition of our existence, and writing about it. 
But there is a second point that I, I want to make here, and uh, this is one of the things I think about a lot when I think about public relations, which is that the industry of public relations and the industry of journalism are very tightly intertwined. We tend to forget that, but public relations supports the journalism industry to a large extent, not just in terms of funding for the ads and the, you know, the other kinds of uh, advertising supported dollars that go into um, newsrooms, but also in terms of writing press releases, bringing items to journalists' attention, creating uh, source relations, so offering up, public relations firms will offer up experts on very specialized topics that journalists can then contact when the topic is, is technical or otherwise complex, sort of beyond the, the scope of everyday writing. And um, a colleague of mine, Aaron Davis, has written about, uh, in Britain, the financial crisis in 2007, 8, 9, and how one of the inputs to that financial crisis was precisely that journalists didn't understand well enough some of the financial instruments, like derivatives, that were causing some of the problems in the financial crisis and were relying too heavily on the sources provided through the public relations outfits that um, were representing these financial clients. So in other words, the journalists were more or less repeating what they were told by these companies about what these financial instruments were doing, and they didn't really understand or investigate or otherwise ask questions about what was happening. And that is one, one of the things that contributed to the scale and scope of the financial crisis. So I just, I try to keep that in mind when I think about how hard it is for journalists to do their job, um, but also, again, to recognize that there's been a lot of change in the last 30 years about how we cover climate change. The, the same thing is true, of course, with, uh, with people in the government, and they're, they, they're relying very much on the public relations people for one side of the story, and, and usually the, the prominent, dominant side of the story. Uh, Bill McKibben, I interviewed him, and he, he said something very interesting to me. He said, you know, I used to think that we were having a debate. And then I realized we had won the debate years ago, and now we were just having a fight. And it was a fight between money and power and, and the people's interest. And um, I, I think that that's true in a lot of cases where it gets positioned as a debate and there's an honest difference of opinion. But, uh, you know, what I found is the people on one side are all getting paid for their work to, to you know, put forward this position. It's not, it's not born out of a deep belief. It's, it's a job. And, and they're good at their job. They're smart and they're capable. And they, they kind of have endless time and the rest of us get burned out because we, we actually have to go and earn a living and do all the things that we do. Well, there's a lot more. We could talk for the whole hour. And, you know, I, I wanted to bring up uh, in your book, you, you uh, quote Walter Lippmann about I believe it was about PR being the manufacturer of consent. And uh, I thought that was a striking term um, that, that because I'm trying to understand how the things that have happened to the National Organic Program possibly could happen, that it's wandering so far from what we all know organic means in the organic movement, which is where all of this came from. And suddenly it doesn't mean that anymore in America. It still means it in the rest of the world. And so how did that consent get manufactured? So let's, maybe for a minute, I, I want to come back to that, but let's go to Rachel Carson, because I think that the story of E. Bruce Harrison, you know, we can hear some of that, is, is very relevant to what's going on. So could you talk a little bit about Rachel Carson, and then we'll get into E. Bruce Harrison's role in that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, you know, such a watershed moment for the environmental movement, consumer rights movement, um, such a symbol of transformation and, and change. Uh, and there, I think there are quite a few things about her book uh, and the ideas in it that made it so powerful. One, which we, we just cannot neglect, I, I talk to my students about this all the time, is it's a beautifully written book. It's so evocative, it's so compelling, it's very honest, uh, 
but it's it's eminently readable. I mean, it's just a book you want to read regardless of your background in science, of your advanced knowledge about any of the things she's, she's talking about. So there's really something to be said for communicating in a way that helps people to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, this could have been a book that was very technical uh, because Rachel Carson was a, a biologist. She, she knew the science and she could have written it for other scientists, but she chose to write it for the general public. And I think that's, that's a really important point. Uh, a second aspect about that book that, that made it so powerful related to that first one is that uh, some of your um, audience may know that this book didn't appear initially as a book. It appeared initially as excerpts in the New Yorker magazine in 1961. So before the book came out as a book in 62, it appeared in the New Yorker. And that too immediately galvanized a series of readers who had throughout the 1950s been asking more and more questions about the pollution uh, of our waters, uh, our land and our air. Um, it helped to no small uh, extent that Rachel Carson was a you know a federal employee with the Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, that she was a longtime science writer, uh, that she was a naturalist. Um, but it also, as I said, it really helped that she was able to connect the dots for a lot of people. In the late 1950s, in uh, Time magazine and Good Housekeeping, there were articles with titles like Subtle New Pollutants Endanger Health and The Danger in Your Water. So as I say, people were starting to think about this. And the timing of Rachel Carson's book and its appearance in The New Yorker really galvanized readers who had already been worrying a little bit about it. Then I, I think it's also really important to think about what came after her, her book came out. A number of factors converged uh, in the 1960s, um, some of which are probably very familiar to you, uh, that ensured the lasting impact of Silent Spring. Um, John F. Kennedy's presidency, um, the federal administration under Kennedy was very you know, actively sympathetic to the argument in the book. Um, there was this spirit of reform that became stronger and stronger throughout the 1960s and into the 70s and spurred a number of social movements that were concerned not only about pesticides, which the topic of Carson's book, but also about whether the scientific and technological progress that had been so heavily advanced um, and promoted to us in the 1940s and 50s was really as progressive as it seemed. Bruce Harrison also went after Ralph Nader. I mean, in, in his early days for the chemical um, trade group that, and he was more successful in undermining Nader as a, somebody that should be respected and listened to in, in the popular culture. Is that correct? I don't remember specifically seeing an undermining of Nader. I do remember, you know, in the in my book, one of the chapters is specifically on public relations, so to speak, in the public interest. And here what we try to get at is the idea that what public relations um, really managed to do for its corporate clients over the course of the 60s and 70s was to present its corporate clients' efforts as being in the public interest. And the reason they did that is that prior to that time, Ralph Nader and his public interest research groups and his uh, legal battles with his, his uh, Nader's Raiders, as they were called, uh, other lawyer teams that were working with him, their goal was to really um, raise the idea of the public interest as a concept that ordinary people could join onto and feel part of. And more than that, to make the public interest of legal standing so that in a courtroom, you could argue that if, for instance, environmental pollution wasn't in the public interest, you could then formulate laws to protect the environment and render that in the public interest. So the public interest was a real weapon, so to speak, uh, by Ralph Nader and, and a number of others, of course, operating uh, around him. 
So what people like Harrison and the PR industry realized was that they had to reframe the meaning of public interest. They had to make public interest something that companies were also connected to. Um, and that was, that was a big part of their work throughout the 1970s and into the 80s. Okay, so let's go to Rio. I think, I think that's a good next stop. Please tell me about Rio. What was that? Well, Rio. So Rio, I, I, of course, I know you're referring to what's been called the Earth Summit, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development that took place in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Now, that conference actually was the culmination of a number of steps, both by environmental advocates or you know, people who were just trying to uh, think about environmental protection and polluting companies that saw the writing on the wall. They worried that the Rio conference would signal an international commitment to global environmental protection that would severely undermine their ability to do business. So in the years leading up to, and I, I mean, it really was a matter of years, in the years leading up to Rio, companies formed, I can't even count the number of coalitions, working groups, task forces, they had trade associations involved, they had um, you know, the major ones like the National Association of Manufacturers, the Chambers of Commerce. It was an all hands on deck moment by the American business community to find ways to influence the Rio process. And so what we saw at Rio is what uh, the sociologist Leslie Sclair has called the capture of sustainability by corporations. Um, and uh, the, uh, the political scientist um, Stephen Bernstein has called that the moment of compromise. Um, it was a moment where companies succeeded in injecting economic considerations into environmental uh, protection, which meant that the bottom line always had to be part of the conversation going forward when we were talking about sustainability and environmental protection. How much was it gonna cost companies to rethink their production? What about jobs? Um, what about the, the costs to the American citizen, American individual? Um, and that import of economic considerations into environmental protection severely undermined the ability of lawmakers to pass laws that were really designed solely for the public interest and environmental protection. So that was a moment where there was this kind of cataclysmic collision between a movement and an industry. And, and how did the industry get to Rio? Were they invited? Oh <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I, have, I have some personal thoughts about it that I'm researching now, but I haven't, I can't put a bottle, you know, I can't uh, say definitively, but I, you know, some pieces of that story I'll have to get back to you on, but rest assured I'm working very hard on it right now. The parts we do know are that companies were, companies saw coming this movement towards sustainability and they saw an opportunity. They saw a door they could walk through to be part of the sustainability movement. And that involved companies developing their own style of environmentalism. Some people have called this corporate environmentalism. Uh, some people call it um, corporate sustainability or more broadly, corporate social responsibility. The idea here, as we said a moment ago, was for companies to appear to be operating in the public interest, to be looking for seats at the table when environmental decisions were being made. So what you started to see was companies adopting voluntary environmental commitments as a way to offset or work around the threat of environmental regulation. So for instance, companies saying, we don't need you to regulate us. We've developed our own benchmarking and auditing process for our environmental footprint. We have our own indices. Um, we're developing partnerships with uh, 
environmental organizations or advocates, sometimes called public-private partnerships, PPPs, ways for companies to really do a, do a lot of PR, you know, say, hey, we're working with the World Wildlife Fund, we're working with the Environmental Defense Fund, we're, we're uh, sitting together at the table and talking about strategies that work for all of us. These are a variety of different ways of inserting themselves into environmental conversations so that they could maintain decision-making power. And Rio, in a way, just consolidated all of those existing efforts and added legitimacy to them. Was, was Bruce Harrison a significant part of that strategy? Absolutely. He was everywhere. <laughs> He was at Rio. He, he went to Rio because a number of his clients uh, in the chemical industry, in the petroleum industry, uh, and uh, tobacco were all themselves going to Rio. There was a, an enormous business delegation at Rio. And incidentally, there is uh, an enormous business delegation at the most recent COP27. And, and there has been uh, every year since Rio. Uh, but prior to that, uh, Harrison and a number of other um, industry representatives were part of uh, an event called WISEM or WISEM, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's W-I-C-E-M, which stands for World Industry Conference on Environmental Management. They had a conference in 1984 in connection with the United Nations Environmental Program and another conference in 1990 or 91. And these were preparatory conferences for Rio. So these were opportunities for companies to coordinate their strategies and develop their own charter of sustainable development that they would sign on to. So when it came to Rio's attempt to create a global charter, the business community showed up and said, no, no, we already have a charter. <laughs> we already have a set of rules that we're going to adhere to. And Harrison was, uh, was part of all of that. He, he was helping his clients coordinate uh, he was helping write some of the strategy. He and his, his team at the E. Bruce Harrison Company. Um, yeah, he was he was very much involved. So this sounds like wonderful news. The the biggest corporations in the world all get climate change, and they're going to voluntarily work to to transform the situation. Of How course, that it work sounds out? like. Yeah, well, it sounds like great news, right? I mean, it makes for great stories in the news. Um, right, so great media coverage. It means these companies can trumpet their environmental commitments and really hold those up to their publics as evidence of their care and commitment. Uh, and it, it means that it was a lot harder to make formal rules um, in the courts uh, or in, in the halls of Washington to regulate these companies. I've heard it suggested that Many of these companies spent more money on advertising their voluntary standards than they spend on implementing them. Do you think that I've heard might the be same. true? Yeah, <laughs> I've heard the same. Um, I mean, certainly, again, you know, as a as a public relations strategy, it was enormously effective um, because it did it. It meant that any time a conversation took place after Rio about environmental protection, or even later about um, climate change, that companies would be at the table in those decision-making processes. And in truth, oh, well, just sorry, just to finish that thought, you know, some environmental groups were really for that strategy. I think, you know, there is that argument that climate change does affect all of us. And more than that, that it's really these, you know, polluting companies, carbon dioxide em emitting companies that have to change their ways in order for all of us to move forward. So. On the one hand, it really makes sense that those companies would be involved in the, the conversations. Um, but on the other hand, you know, yes, sure, if it's just PR or if they're talking the talk a lot more than they're walking the walk, that then it's really a moment for concern. There was a, a thing that happened in recent years where Danone, um, the second biggest uh, dairy company in the world, um, got new leadership with Emmanuel Faber, and he was their, their CEO. And he truly seemed to be uh, 
seeking transformation in a very uh, environmentally positive way. And it went very well until they had an off quarter and then, then there was a stockholder revolt and they got rid of them. And, um, you know, I, I wonder whether, whether a, a large corporation possibly can make that kind of change because they are, after all, dictated by their returns, you know, their survival. That's something I worry about a lot. I wonder to what extent sustainability ends up meaning business as usual. Because when we talk about sustainability now as a, an American community, we are willing to allow companies to really define the terms of what that means. So for instance, you know, if we go to buy a product in a supermarket or, or in any kind of store, and we're told that that product is more sustainable on the label, on the packaging, we might be more inclined to buy it. And so we're using our consumer choice to say, yes, I, that, I share those values. I believe in sustainability and I'm gonna buy this product instead of that one. But what have we really done there? We're, we're still buying a product, <laughs> right? We're still, we're still acquiring material things. And we're also just taking for granted that what it says on the label is true. We don't, most of us have the time uh, to investigate in depth what those companies mean when they put sustainable on their label. And I wonder if without a more radical shift in lifestyle, but also in what we allow companies to tell us they're doing, we aren't going to really move far enough beyond the talking the talk part uh, and the, the business's ability to define for us what sustainability really is. Yeah. Yeah, these are all the issues that the organic uh, movement and the organic brand are struggling with. Um, is is um, as organic becomes more popular, does it have less and less to do with organic? And of course, there is truth in that. But the question is: Is there a, a place at which we can officially, you know, have a funeral and say that organic has lost its soul? Um, and and we'll see. But but one of the things that that I have been fascinated by as I started to discover your work was this idea that this was a relatively new strategy. That, that really came out of the climate catastrophe movement of let's not fight them, let's join them, and, but not really. And uh, was that a new strategy or has that been going on for 100 years? The strategy of um, consensus formation and um, everyone sitting at the table, having multiple stakeholders participating in the resolution of a problem, I really saw that coming out in the 1970s and 1980s in full force. Uh, a number of people working with E. Bruce Harrison at that time, oh, I don't want to say they necessarily pioneered it because I think a lot of um, consultancies were doing this at that time, but they certainly were heavily involved in advancing the idea that you needed um, you needed private and public sector participants working together to resolve environmental problems. So I, I really do see that as a more like a 50 year phenomenon that's gone up and down different waves. It's taken slightly different forms over the years, but um, it, it has been around for, for quite some time. Yeah. It, it seems to me to be now kind of, almost a given that that a corporate strategy is to say we're with them as opposed to we don't like them. It's interesting in organic, there are still large companies like Syngenta and Bear Monsanto that say we don't like organic because there's just no way that what they do could possibly be organic. But there are many other companies where they go, well, we have an organic, organic line and then we have the chemical conventional line. Right. And, yeah. you know, we, we like organic too. That's what you're describing is something else I've seen that I, I want to point out, which is a, a kind of multi-pronged strategy. 
some of the very large companies can afford to do a lot of things at once, you know, have a lot of different strategic approaches to, say, um, managing environmental issues. Some of those approaches might be consensus-based, and they're essentially a kind of, if not co-optation, at least these elaborate partnerships with public sector organizations for reputational purposes, and again, to kind of make it seem as though there's, there's consensus and compromise being found. But then a whole other set of strategies might be very antagonistic. It might be about fighting cases in court um, or really, you know, pulling out the big guns and sending lobbyists. We, we do hear about that kind of thing in the media all the time. You know, when a company says it's working on some sort of environmental sustainability initiative, and then you find out that they've actually been pushing to do drilling in some other place in the country. So I really have seen these multi-pronged strategies taking place. It's not just a matter of we do this or we do that. Yeah, I, I've actually experienced that there are different branches of a company that are very different. Mm -hmm. And that the people who work for the organic part of the company, they really believe in organic. And it, you know, it's it's genuine and authentic, but they're an incredibly small voice in a very um loud chorus. And they they really don't run the show. They run their little little part of it. And um it confuses people where they go, well wait a minute, are they for us or against us? And you know, if there is an us that, that we identify with. And I, it seems that that us is important. I, I think obviously Ralph Nader, I think Rachel Carson was trying to create a movement of people who would, you know, unite in trying to work for the world we want. Yeah, I wonder to what extent this isn't, to some to some extent, a branding problem. In other words, branding is such a powerful magic. I spoke about it at the beginning as such. And one way in which it works its magic is that it's such a coherent idea. And, you know, it becomes coherent because companies spend millions of dollars on their brand. So when we think about the name of a particular company, you know, let's take Monsanto since you, you mentioned it. Monsanto has been very good at branding itself in a particular way so that we think of it as one thing or one personality. And a lot of people, have, when they talk about the strategy of branding, they talk about a brand personality. Um, and that's, again, that's by design. I mean, that's, that's part of a brand strategist's work is to make a brand seem like a, a comfortable or approachable individual. And when we think of a company as a brand, then we tend to associate it with one thing. We don't like to think of a split personality. We don't like to think of uh, you know, doing one thing and then doing something that absolutely contradicts what they've just done. So sometimes I wonder if we neglect to think about how these companies are actually have massive tentacles. And as you say, maybe they have a little organic wing and that organic wing is staffed with well-meaning, devoted, compassionate people. But we don't know what's happening in the rest of the company and we don't know how integrated the company is. Often the structure of a company is very hard to find out about if you're not on the inside. So it's, it's really hard to know, does the whole company believe in the brand or is the brand really a kind of external manifestation for audiences, but not at all how people think about it when they're working for that company on the inside? Yeah. Uh, w one of the organic pioneers named Fred Kirshenman was asked while he was giving a talk. Uh, he's he's a farmer and he's he's old. He's retired now. Um, he's not. He's still still active in the world. But but he was asked, "What would you do if you were the Secretary of Agriculture?" And his response was, "Well, that all depends on how long I wanted to be Secretary of Agriculture. Because if I did what I want, I wouldn't be Secretary for another two days." And, you know, that's, that's the point that these problems, in a sense, aren't personal. It's not about there's a bad person who's the head of this company or that company. It's about who can possibly survive in that position. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough job. It's a tough job. And, you know, I, I don't think I could ever be a CEO of a company. <laughs> I don't think I could do it. Any company. Yes. I, yeah, it's a, it's a very hard position to be in. And I, I think sometimes, 
and this is important to say, um, often when we have conversations about environmental issues or climate, we end up having a conversation about us and them. It's a good guy, bad guy narrative. It goes very quickly into that way of talking about it. And it's hard to avoid because often it does feel that way. And especially now in the very polarized political and media environment we find ourselves in, it's, you know, it's accentuated every day. And yet I think a lot of people, more people than we might imagine, want to do the right thing. I think more people than we imagine are very worried about environmental change, about global warming, and want to take action. Some of those people work for companies that have historically been seen as the bad guys. And that's challenging. I, you know, people have very different uh, understandings of their work identities as compared to their personal identities, or they feel they can make a difference from within. And so that's why they might work for an organization like that. Or, you know, to be honest, people need a job and they, they have a job and that's what they do. But from there to demonizing people is, is sometimes I think one of the things that increases the sense of polarization when we're talking about these problems. Um, you know, and I, I don't have a great answer for how to deal with that other than in my own writing, I'm really careful not to have a slings and arrows approach to what I do, not to demonize a particular group or a particular company or a particular individual, at least not until I have a very, very good understanding of the twists and turns that they've been through. Um, I'd rather have a more, oh, that's a tricky one to say. I was gonna say, I'd, I, I guess I would really rather feel like if I'm going to make claims about certain people doing good or doing bad that I feel I can really support those claims with, with some evidence. Well, you, you described this in the book uh, very interestingly, where you talked about the confusion of getting to know Bruce Harrison because he was a very nice person and he was uh, very helpful to you in your research. In a way, he gave you this treasure trove of all of his uh, stories and, and files so that it was all backed up and everything. And at the same time, he's one of the people most responsible for setting back an attempt to reverse climate change for 30 years. So again, it's not about vilifying an individual. It's simply about, I think I wrote it down. You wrote, uh, you were talking about PR, which is regal regarded as manipulative distortions of reality. And you wrote, quote, the question at the core of this book is how such manipulations have been so devastatingly effective. And so we can say that it's not our goal to vilify people. And I actually think that it's not about people. We can say that people make choices and they should be responsible for their choices. But the truth is, if somebody's not willing to make the choice, they'll get somebody else who is. And the question is, what is this, this system that we are all part of that is allowing such uh, terrible things to happen that are really not what we want to have happen? This is, <laughs> I mean, I think in a way you're describing my, my life's work here is trying to get to the bottom of, of that very question. Some people, well, I think most of us, you know, this now this is, you know, kind of moving off. I'm just think I'm sort of thinking out loud here. Most of us want to do the right thing, but we don't all share an understanding of what the right thing is. And when I look at a system of legitimacy like public relations, what I really am trying to understand is how does public relations work? to advance certain social, cultural, political ideas that we grab onto as a community, as a society. Why are those ways of communicating to us so powerful and so effective and ultimately manipulative in the most basic sense of manipulative, in the sense that there is control over what and how we see things and don't see them? And what I've come to understand is that it's 
a much broader system than we tend to think about. So it's not merely spin. We, you know, sometimes we think about PR, we think, oh, there's spin. And so what PR people are doing is they're just hiding the truth. You know, they're lying and they're hiding the truth. It's a lot more complicated than that because we all have our own truths. And what PR is very good at is at legitimacy, which is about making you feel as though you've been told a truth. That's very different. <laughs> it's very different from the truth versus the not truth. And, you know, we could argue that in, in uh, American politics over the last number of years, we've been really confronted by that idea and very polarized by that idea that there isn't just one truth and there isn't just one set of facts and so on. And it's, it's, it's really contributed to the kind of distrust or sense that we're being lied to or otherwise kind of manipulated uh, in the world and that we're, we're disconnected from, from each other. Um, let me see if I can take this back to my, to my main point. What public relations does is it, it connects to us. It connects to what we care about. And I think there's a lesson in there for us, uh, for those of us who aren't PR professionals, but who want to communicate about what really matters. Throwing out facts and you know saying I'm right and you're wrong is a great way to disconnect from other people. It's a great way to have people stop listening to you. If on the other hand, we're communicating about something we care about and we really want someone else to care about it too, and we can show them why we care about it so much, that can be very effective. And to, that is precisely how public relations works at an industrial level. It's very clever. You know, I have to be impressed by the ability of public <laughs> relations people to have understood that, that way of connecting to others. And when I hear common frames about climate change being repeated in politics, uh, you know, in, in various promotional campaigns, uh, in public affairs, I, I see why those frames get used over and over again. It's because they work. It's because they do connect to people. And it's very hard to undo those frames once they're established. So one answer to that question I posed at the beginning of the book, how has this manipulation been so effective, is that it really has come to reach people where they live. It's really connecting to them. And so I think if we want to, by we, I mean those of us who really want to push action forward on climate change, uh, on environmental issues, if we want to do that, we too need to have a compelling story. We too need to show why it matters and why we care. You know, one answer I would give to that question I posed at the beginning of the book about how this manipulation has been so effective is that it has succeeded in conveying why an issue matters and why we should care about it. And so I can't help but think that when those ways of communicating are so effective, if you're wanting to then convey why climate action, why protecting the environment is so essential, why can't we use those same compelling narratives? Why can't we ourselves tell a great story? We, you know, not that we don't. I think, I think uh, environmental advocates have, have done some amazing work uh, trying to talk about the climate and why it matters, environmental change. Um, when I think about what we were talking, what we were discussing earlier with Rachel Carson's book, it was such a compelling story. It was a story that showed us why we should care. And it was rooted in science. It was rooted in facts. But it wasn't a book with flow charts and numbers and you know figures and, and stuff like that. It was a book about painting a picture of our lives and of what kind of life we want to live. And that, I think, is a really important way to think about communicating about the things that matter to us, whether they're uh, farming, organic farming, climate change, other environmental issues. Okay. I, I, 
you know, I, I got to interview Seth Godin, who's a marketing guy. I remember, yeah, I, I know him. Yeah, do you know? Not personally, I mean, yeah, so I, I don't know him personally, but I know who he yeah. is. Yeah. He, he's very interesting. I took his alt MBA oh, yeah. online thing, which was fascinating. And when I was talking to him, I said, you know, Seth, you, you teach brilliant marketing tools, and it strikes me that they are ethically neutral and that these same skills, these, this really quite powerful skill set that, that you've developed could be used for ill just as well as for good, because he always intends it to be ethical marketing. And, you know, he said, yeah, that's right. And I've been horrified by what's happened to the Internet, which I at first thought would be the great voice of democratization of our society, and instead it's become a cesspit. cesspit. So... Um, it, it, it is, these are powerful tools. We can study them and try to make use of them. Uh, we, we might always get, get out-talked, out-storied on this. Sure. Uh, they have so much resource to, <laughs> to do this well. It's our money. We keep spending it with them. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean, we cannot deny the resource differentials, and we can't deny either that there's a, quite a lot of coordination and networked um, interaction taking place on the side of industry. I, I don't want to underplay that because that's a very important piece of this, this story. When we feel like the same story is we're seeing it everywhere, it's not by chance. Those are often very strategically determined. There are a lot of nodes on the network. There are a lot of groups with very deep pockets sometimes working to manipulate the conversation uh, about whether it's climate change or, or anything else. And uh, we, can't, we can't lose sight of that. So I, as I say, I don't, I don't mean to make it seem as though all we need is a great story, because I do sometimes think that that's, um, that's, that's an easy answer, but it's, it's more complex than that. That said, um, one of the things I try really hard to do in my writing and, and in my teaching my students is to just help us think through how strategic a lot of the information is that we're seeing and then to develop a kind of media literacy around that, a kind of understanding of where these frames are coming from, how they're circulating, why they're circulating, um, and what to do about it. And I think adopting a, a different relationship to the information that we see is one step toward uh, feeling like we have more control over what we can say and what we're being told. Yeah. I, I don't want to stop, but we should. So, uh, <laughs> Melissa Ronchek, thank you very much for talking today. This was great. I, I hope sometime in the future we'll talk again. I hope so too, uh, Dave. More to say. Thanks for inviting me. It's really been such a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe and share the link with your friends. Please take time today to leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. Please join us next time when I'll be talking to Real Organic Project's Director of Certification, Ariel Pressman. He and I discussed his origins in farming, why it's important to us that Real Organic inspectors and our boards are farmer-led, and that our certification program remains free to farmers. After listening, we hope that you'll want to promote our certification program in your community. And finally, if you're listening to us from Durango, Colorado, we're hosting a free screening of our Bridge Symposium at Fort Lewis College on April 25th at 6.30 in the Viacita Room. The 45-minute documentary is going to be followed by a panel of local organic farmers discussing what we believe real farming for the climate looks like on our farms. If you'd like to host a similar event in your town, please email me at lindley, L-I-N-L-E-Y, at realorganicproject.org.